Well, hello, if you're already with us, uh, we'll just give it a moment as more people arrive. The doors are open, as it were, to the forum. So just bear with us as everyone uh, comes in. Um, we'll be starting very shortly. I can see you all pouring in. The numbers are uh, flying up. So I'll do, do all the introductions and uh, say uh, a, a few words. And John White, the chairman, will say a few words as well. But uh, when, when the numbers uh, have settled down a little, because we're over 100, it's quite fascinating seeing how many people are coming in. We're flying up to 120, starting to slow down a little bit. Um, so uh, as things are now beginning to settle down, uh, maybe I'll, I'll say a proper hello to you all. Thank you very much for joining us once again in uh, what is another online season tickets holders forum. Uh, we're getting used to these Zoom calls. We're not quite bored of them yet. It's uh, getting a little bit of a, a strain sometimes on the Sunday evening family quiz, but we're still doing them and we're still doing these forums as well. But uh, these have worked really well so far. I've really enjoyed uh, being involved with them. It gives us a chance to uh, hear from you as well as hearing from some of the key people at Saints. So I will... And uh, John, I think you'd like to start by saying... Yes, uh, again, well, just really to endorse your welcome, Graham, to everyone. It's great to have so many people joining us this evening, as usual. Um, it is uh, over, well, over two years since we had our face-to-face, -face, uh, last face-to-face -face forum. And we hope to that, that later on in the season that we'll be having another face-to-face -face for those people that are interested in that. But for the time being... We're virtual. Uh, that has its benefits anyway, as you just mentioned. We, we've got, uh, we expect over 300 people to join us tonight. Well, you know, we couldn't couldn't accommodate those sensibly at the Rod, but so it opens it up to more. So, um, you know, we will probably uh, alternate as we go forward with these forums, perhaps, perhaps two a season as we did last season, uh, rather than just the one. But, um, you know, we'll, we'll, as usual, we'll take feedback from you, the supporters, as to what you want and what you prefer. Um, tonight's obviously about questions uh, and answers. I expect that both Chris and Mark will be getting the bulk of those, but uh, I, I don't worry about that. They're the guys who really make it tick at the Saints. So uh, without further ado to me, let's go back to you, Graham, and uh, if you would uh, lead the session. Yeah, thanks, uh, John. Yeah, lots of questions have come in already, but uh, please keep sending them in. There's a Q&A function here on Zoom this evening. Uh, so while we're talking, get your questions in and I'll get through as many as possible. We do have a lot to get through, uh, so we'll crack straight on. And uh, let's start with you, Boydie. Um, well, we... we despite not winning in the weekend against London Irish, we were very pleased with the performance of our, of our group that, you know, included um, a significant number of uh, youngsters. I think Alan Dickens sent us a thing from the English under 20 spreadsheet to say that there were more Northampton Saints under 20 players playing in the weekend than, than any other club. Um, and so we went young and we were very happy with some of the youngsters. So it's been a good learning week and by and large that that group will crack on again next week. And it's been interesting. We have 10 away with international duties at the moment, which is, you know, fantastic for the club, but it does have a, does have a dark side. Uh, Nick Alterac with Scotland, Dan Bigger with Wales, uh, the three boys in Fiji and then the five boys with England. So we've got 10 away, plus we've got 11 injured at the moment. So the squad's um, under pressure um, a little bit, um, but we're, we're, we, you know, we're, we're going along quite nicely, despite some of the uh, results the last couple of weeks. Uh, how, how do you feel overall the season started then for Saints? Well, um, as I've said to other people, we, we, we have 24 matches in the season and we divide them roughly into blocks of four to sort of try and theme up a block. And the first four weeks on the, on the external evidence, you'd think three out of four you'd be pretty happy with. But after we beat Exeter at Exeter, uh, we were massively disappointed to have a, a, a bit of a poor performance against Wasps. Um, on the back of a fairly ill-disciplined um, performance. 
and but ended up in that block three out of four. So I think you know we would have taken um, that as with Gloucester, Irish, um, Exeter, and what. So that was okay. Then obviously the next one, uh, we had a pretty good start against Worcester and then um, massively disappointing result against Leicester. Um, and the performance wasn't good either, but it wasn't actually as far away as, you know, people might have thought um, with that, you know, it blew out at the end with two tries when we were chasing the game and it got away from us, which is massively disappointing to be the side that conceded the biggest score against Leicester. So we'll, you know, we've got a job to rectify that. And then the sale performance wasn't great either. And sale we have had particular trouble with in the last three or four years. We've only managed to beat them up there once. Um, you know, they'd had a disappointing game against Worcester and they, you know, um, the frustrating thing about that was that the referees came back and apologized about the first try, which was the Mauling try, uh, which was a blatant obstruction, which they missed. Um, and it could have been six all at half time. So uh, sounds like a lot of excuses there, but um, we're not particular. We're certainly not happy with the outcome now across the start of the season, and, and we've still got some more to come in the in the performance. And uh, on the what about off the pitch, uh, Mark or John? I mean, you had your financial results come out to you uh, last week. I think it was. It's it's quite a complex and quite a lengthy document. So which of you two would like to explain to me, well, how the financial position of the club's looking after what's well, been a, well, an unbelievable year? I think to get an absolutely accurate, detailed description about our financial accounts, we would have needed to invite Julia Chapman, our FD. But um, yes, it's, it's, it's not as clear as you would like it uh, in terms of comparisons and uh, like for like. But um, suffice to say, we believe we've done pretty well, given the circumstances we've come through. You know, the, the impact of, of COVID, you, we, you can't overestimate it. We thankfully entered the uh, pandemic with a good, strong balance sheet. We had cash in the bank from the CVC deal. Uh, and, we, you know, it's on record all the action we took. To, to mit mitigate things for virtually two years now. Uh, it's, we've come through it. We're in fine shape, as anybody can look at the accounts. You know, we've, we've got um, a lot more debt than we had, but that's the impact of it. We've spent a lot of the cash that we, we, we sort of earmarked for other things to um, frankly get through this last two years. But uh, we have come out of it pretty well, albeit, as I say, with, with more debt on our balance sheet. Um, we, 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 we took the benefit of a government uh, loan during that period. But in terms of our underlying trading, that's been pretty good. We, we, were, we were well on the road to recovery before the pandemic, which is disappointing. I know it's disappointing to Mark and all the team who worked so hard to get us on an even keel and get an improving trend year on year. And we were, we were well on with that for a, a, what at that time was a five-year plan. But, um, you know, we got knocked off course because no revenue coming in and plenty of money going out. Um, you don't need a mathematician or be a biz, top businessman to realise that's pretty painful. But I think we can now look back on what was a reasonable year last year and over the next two or three years, picking up where we left off pre-pandemic and, and moving the business forward. And, and Mark's, you know, working very hard with his team to do that. And uh, there's a lot of uh, exciting things to happen, but it's on the back of uh, more debt, I'm afraid. But, uh, you know, we, we can manage that. We can see visibility coming out of it over the next three or four years. So that's encouraging. Uh, has it changed your plans, your longer term plans then? Um well, inevitably, it's, it's knocked us back almost two years, really. We, we put everything sort of on ice in many ways. Um, you know, fundamentally, we had to change. We, 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 had, to, we had to adopt a, a focus on, I think survival is too strong a word, but, you know, sustainability and getting, getting through it. And we've come through it with flying colours. Uh, to compare to anybody, any of the other sides around, and, and we're in stronger position than a lot of us. But so yes, it, 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 it 
as I say, we, we, we raised quite a lot of cash from the CVC deal and uh, we, we've got great plans to look after it, but to invest it wisely. And so we've, um, you know, we've, we've had to take stock of that. But, uh, you know, a, lo a lot of people will know we, we, we mentioned that we've just put in planning application for an indoor training facility which we which we can fund we've got benefactors who have been very supportive uh so you know it, it's all systems go again now but but undoubtedly everything's gone back two years well you mentioned the 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 new training ground and the planning application um just fill us in a bit more about that uh mark is that one for you uh, can you give us an update yeah. on on well what the plan is and, and where you are with it yeah, sure. I mean, as John said, it's really exciting development for the club. We've been speaking with Chris and uh, the other folks in the performance end of uh, the club for a while about our facilities. I think we're really blessed with what we've got here at, at Franklin's Gardens. We've got a fantastic stadium pitch. We've got training pitches on site. We think there's a real intangible benefit of having the team based at Franklin's Gardens the whole time. That's quite rare, actually, as you look across the Premiership and other sides in World Rugby, but we think there's benefit to that. But the one thing we've been missing is an indoor facility. And if you look at most elite level clubs around the world now, and certainly the, the unions and the international sides, access to a large scale indoor facility has become you know, a pretty key requirement to the way you, you shape and run your training week. Um, whilst we're blessed with our facilities here, our pitches do get a bit a bit boggy and a bit wet in the heart of winter. We train quite regularly at the university on an AstroTurf pitch now. And having a sort of half uh, rugby size pitch indoors will just transform what we're able to do on site consistently year round. So it's something we've been looking at for a while. Um, we, we've had a very kind donation, as John mentioned, from a longstanding supporter of the club. And so this was this was priority number one in terms of the development of Franklin's Gardens. And so we worked with Chris and the team to shape what that looks like. Um, planning permission is now in. That went in a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so we've been working with West North Ants Council. We're expecting the sort of determination of that application in the back end of January. So we're really hopeful for a positive outcome there. And, and ultimately, we hope to build what's a pretty big structure. It's a sort of 75 by 60 metre barn type structure, which houses a full half pitch replicating the pitch that we've got out on the stadium, well, at least half of it. Um, so really exciting times and hopefully the first step in some further development as we look at a master plan for Franklin's Gardens more broadly. It sounds exciting, uh, Chris. From a coach's perspective, how important is that sort of facility then? Oh, it's massive. You can't, we can't get any, once the fields out the back get wet and boggy. And I mean, the old school punters that are listening will say, you know, that's what you play in, but it's, it's actually not because Franklin's Gardens, um, you know, the cinch stadium, it's the, it's the best in, in the country. So we, we train on, on you know, a, a, a muddy surface and play on a fantastic surface. You can't get any quality. Um, as Mark said, you know, we're going to start busing up to the university up to three times a week back and forward. Uh, it'll just make a massive difference to our ability to, um, you know, to do schools and units and half field team training um, when when the when the weather more particularly the ground doesn't allow us to get quality training and speaking to the guys that have from other clubs that have built the same thing in the last couple of years they've just found them you know indispensable and wondered why that they weren't done years ago so you're yeah, something the players are, are looking looking forward to you mentioned Boydie there, the, uh, the first mention of the evening of the Cinch Stadium at Franklin's Gardens. Um, so who wants to talk about that decision? Mark, one for you. Uh, how, how did that go down? Uh, how did you come to that decision? How do you think it's gone down? Uh, well, I mean, I'll give you a bit of context, I guess, on the decision. That'll be helpful for people. So we've been really lucky. Right? Travis Perkins have been our main sponsor at the club for you know 20 plus years now. Absolutely incredible relationship. We celebrated it recently at... Um, I think it was at Worcester game. Um, we've been talking to Travis Perkins for a while because they've had a lot of change in their business, new chief exec, new chair, um, new chief operating officer. And whilst they've sort of cemented their commitment to the club for the long term, uh, we knew at some point they were going to come away from the main position, the front of shirt position. 
And they've done that really respectfully, giving us lots of lead time. So we were going back out into the market for what's a critical sponsorship position. Sponsorship is really high margin revenue. That means a lot of it drops straight to the bottom line. So you have to get your sponsorship income right to have a thriving commercial business. And we'd started a year or so ago during the pandemic, a relationship with Cinch, brilliant local brand, innovative digital brand, great people rooted in Northampton and the surrounding area. Uh, Avril, the lady that runs Cinch, has been a box holder here for five plus years. So we've had a relationship for a while. And in some ways we got lucky with the timing. They launched Cinch, big public facing brand and see sport as a mechanism to grow awareness of that of that brand you'll have seen they've partnered with other really big sporting properties england england cricket tottenham hotspur well, i don't know whether tottenham hotspur are big or not but um other big sporting institutes and so um we went to cinch when we knew that that travis perkins were leaving and said there may be a bigger opportunity would you be keen on a conversation and and that developed and we saw the opportunity to create what we thought was a really transformational deal for the club. John's already touched on the need for us to you know, manage our finances more carefully than ever, given what we've been through over the last couple of years. And by rolling in the stadium naming rights to the main sponsorship position, we were able to deliver with Cinch what we're pretty confident is the biggest sponsorship deal ever in club rugby, certainly that exists at the moment at a time, you know, in the middle of a pandemic when you desperately need those resources. So from a commercial perspective, a really, really attractive deal at a time where the club desperately needed some cash. We knew, obviously, that um, it was a big change, though. A, a naming rights change is always a significant one. There are lots of precedents in sport now, but this place has a real historic appeal. And so we wanted to manage that change really thoughtfully and carefully. And so by renaming the stadium, but making sure we kept the Franklin's Gardens name uh, was really critical to us, particularly given our site is more than just the stadium in the way we operate it now and the way that we use it and in the way that it means so much to the community. So we've we've tried to handle that sensitively, but it was a really, really attractive commercial um, offer that we received for that sponsorship. How's it gone down? Um, inevitably, there was a bit of chatter about it at the time. Some people saying, why have you why have you done this? You know, the, the, there's a historical legacy here, and that's a very fair question. But when we weighed up all of the inputs and considerations, we thought very clearly it was the right move. And it was actually fascinating watching the discussion between our supporters. So we went out and tried to explain the decision. Some people say, I don't like it. Why would you ever change that name? But a number of other supporters, I think, or recognise that commercial need and the, you know, the financial imperatives that we're working towards now. So we, we thought it was the right decision. And on the whole, I think it's been received pretty positively. And you know our, our commercial team, whilst it was a big decision, have done a great job landing that landing that deal for us. I'd imagine Mr. Franklin had similar questions when he renamed Melbourne Gardens after his hotel. So th there's nothing new, is there, about this in some ways? Um, right. Some questions coming in for you um, from uh, supporters, and keep them coming in. Use that Q and A function at the bottom of the Zoom link. Uh, send them in. Ben Summers wants to know. Um, what are Saints doing to reduce the environmental impact of the club? Does the club have a sustainability strategy to guide future actions? That's an interesting question. Yeah, and a really good question. And yes, we do. Um, I mean, we've actually, if you look at what we've done over the last couple of years, we probably haven't shouted too much about this. And maybe that's a, a mistake on our part. But, you know, we've done a number of things already, I think, to drive a sustainability agenda. So obviously the use of eco cups. Um, we bring in all of our energy from renewable sources. Uh, we use the water on the pitch is all from a natural source here on site. So we're not drawing significant reserves from the uh, from the environment around us. We don't any longer use uh, plastic cutlery, you know, non recyclable sachets or food trays in any of our catering opposite um, in any of our catering opposite um, operation. We're actually about to install some new solar panels on the top of um, the Barwell stand which will mean that almost 10% of our energy, I think, is being generated by solar on site. We'll integrate those panels into the new build of the, the training facility too. Uh, we're actually in the process of signing up to uh, the United Nations Sport for Climate Action Pro Programme, which means we make a number of statements around our intention to continue to drive 
the sustainability agenda moving forward. And then we've also we've installed sort of water dispensers around the ground as well to, to reduce the use of plastic bottles. I think from this season, all of the bottles that we that we use on site are recycled PET. And then finally, we're working with Levy, our catering partner, to support their ambition to be um, carbon neutral, I think it's by 2030. So we've got a number of individual initiatives. We probably need to tell a bit more of a compelling story about that publicly, if I'm honest, but I think our supporters can hopefully take heart in the fact that we've got a number of initiatives underway in that space. Uh, Chris, a rugby question for you from uh, Charles McGilvery. He says, do you, do you, Chris, feel this side has now truly found its identity? I think that's an evolving question uh, all the time. I think it's starting to understand, we probably use the term DNA a bit more than identity, but I think uh, it's been a little bit of a slow burn and obviously things shift each year, but but I think I think the group now understand what we need to do uh, on the field, how we need to play, and 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 what that means. So yeah, and, and it's still it's still evolving and it's still young. I think it's still one of the youngest squads and thing, but we can't keep saying it's young. At some stage, the tree's got to bear some fruit. So yeah, I think we're heading in the right direction. And you touched on this earlier, uh, Chris, but a lot of people have been asking about the benefits uh, of players going away on international duty, as opposed to the, obviously, the negatives that you have. And you, you've lost quite a few of you. Well, it is not just England, it's Fiji, it's Wales, it's Scotland on occasion. Where do you stand on that? Well, uh, all, all three of you, really, where do you stand on that? Well, from my point of view, I think it's great that people get recognised out of, out of your organisation to play for their country, whether it's for England or, or another country. We have to take that into account uh, carefully because it does put a bit of a, a, a dent in your own numbers. When you look at it, it's not quite as bad. I mean, these three weeks in the Autumn Internationals, two of them are PRC games, which, you know, in the Cup, we pay our, our youngsters in the back end of our squad anyway. So there was only... In this block, there was only real to say it, really the sale game. Uh, it is inconvenient when they go away and they come back and only make the last day of training and stuff like that. But I, I genuinely believe the support we give our players and encouragement to play for their country is well paid back in the support they give to the club and the recognition the club gets for those guys representing us. I don't know what the others think, but I think it's just part of, part of what we do. Yeah. Well, I, I think you're right there, Chris. I, I mean, you know, we, we wholeheartedly support it as a board. I mean, it's recognition that how well we're doing if we're getting good players through the system that get picked to play for their country. And, and whilst it can be annoying with injuries sustained while they're away or, uh, you know, missing very important games, like we had some missing from the Leicester game, um, you know, th those are annoying issues, but I think overall we have to support that role. And the players, it's great for them. So who would want to stand in their way? And uh, so, uh, yeah, I think we take a pretty realistic, reasonable view of it as a club. I think the only, the only, I agree with all of that. I think the only thing I would add is that I think it is a broader challenge for our sport. You know, if you take a step back, it's not ideal, quite frankly, for our elite league, the Premiership, that we're playing matches on the same days as international matches. It's not good for the audience. And that, that's a challenge for the, for the calendar. And there's a lot of work going on at league level to try and you know, ensure that we get the right calendar that works for us as a league, that works for the international game on a global scale more broadly. It's a really tricky conundrum. And, and you know, we're, we're inputting into those discussions as best we can. But it's, if you do take a step back, it's not ideal that, that there's overlap. But as the others have said, you know, we're encouraging our players to strive to represent their countries because we think that has benefit for them and for our club more broadly. Is there a financial um, impact, Mark? I mean, if, if players get picked for England, you, you obviously benefit from that, don't you? Yeah, you do. There's a, as part of what's called the professional game agreement, certainly for the England players, you receive, in inverted commas, some compensation when they're selected into England squads. 
Um, one of the challenges, and, and Chris alluded to this, is that you don't know who's going to get selected in those squads at the time you're designing your own squad for that particular season. So it brings a layer of complexity to what's always a challenging, already a challenging process, right? Designing your squad within the confines of a, a salary cap and your own resources. So yes, there is some sort of compensation as part of the agreement, but there are some broader questions you have to answer as you're, you're building your own squad and some assumptions that you have to make in that context. So from, from your perspective, um, I, I slightly obsess about Fraser Dingwall if he's going to go for Scotland or for England, but from a club's perspective, you'd rather him go for England. Uh, y yes, um, not 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 just for financial reasons, but yeah, I think <laughs> you know it'd be nice to have another England player. Um, but and you know, I think I think we all feel Fraser's got a really big future ahead of him. So let's hope he continues to thrive. I think I think the other thing that's worth noting, um, you know, Courtney's always been here, uh, but out of the ten guys that have been playing international in this period of time, plus. Rory Hutchinson, who got picked for Scotland, um, but hasn't been reselected. Only Dan Bigger was an international before he came to the club. So those those boys have got their opportunity on performances that they've they've done while they're here at Franklin's Garden. So I think that's a you know I think that's another important thing for me. Uh, staying with the rugby question from Tony Bullamere, he says the absence of any wondrous fixtures this season is hugely disappointing as indeed is the apparent abandonment of the A-League. Are there any plans to play any official fixtures against other teams who regret the loss of these fixtures, or is it just a question of subbing players out to Bedford? Well, I think, firstly, in the absence of, of an A-League or a development competition, our relationship is mutually beneficial to Bedford and to us, and I think it's working fantastically well. So... We have had up to eight players in a, in a week and down as low as two um, playing each week at Bedford as, as their needs and our needs vary. But it's a mechanism for us to give um, our second year academy boys and the back end of our roster who are not getting time a way to play. Do I think it's the best way to develop um, rugby in, in, in England? Probably not. But I think in the official process, I think our relationship with Bedford is, is better than anybody else in the league is currently is currently doing. Personally, um, you know, I think this is the biggest challenge for the RFU, how they have a talent pathway from England under 18s to England under 20s to their England national side. Somewhere in there, there has to be a competition that represents something below the league. And, you know, whether that's an under-19 competition that plays on Monday nights, whether it's an under-23 competition that plays curtain raises or before your main game, whether it's, I'm not sure what it is, but, but there definitely has to be some sort of national mechanism to grow and blood our youngsters out of... 16s, 18s, 20s, and on to fully professional environments. I think just, I think just on that, again, to add to what Chris has said, um, I think the A-League is in part, at present, a bit of a victim of the of COVID circumstances with all of the regulations and testing that's still in place, even though society, for, for us in this elite environment, even though society has sort of opened up, you know, a little... Um, those fixtures have been challenging. I think the other thing that you've seen happen over the last 18 months or so is that almost without exception, uh, clubs in the Premiership have reduced their squad sizes as everyone has been you know, scrambling, again, to use John's turn of phrase from, from earlier, to ensure their own sustainability. And we already know that, you know, the nature of the Premiership is a pretty attritional, it's a pretty attritional league. You need a good deep squad to cover those fixtures and with a falling squad size it makes regular A-League games particularly against a COVID backdrop of all those procedures and regulations really challenging so I, I don't think the A-League has gone forever far from it but as again as Chris has alluded to I think one of the questions is what does the structure both of the Premiership look like and you know the, the support matches that, that drop out of that into the future. Uh, can I br briefly ask you about ring fencing? Um, a question came in to ask, uh, do you think it's made it 
a better or a worse product, the Premiership now that is ring fencing? Mark, I'll ask you first, or, or John, uh, and then see see what Boydie thinks. Because Boydie, oh. I know you've always been a fan of ring fencing, haven't you? But John, what do you think? Well, I, I think we just have to be careful with that phrase, actually, Graham, ring fencing, because in fact, uh, you know, we're 13 clubs this year. The chances are we'll go to 14 if there's a club that will will satisfy the minimum standards and requirements. So it's not actually, there's not going, there wasn't any relegation last season. There won't be any relegation this season because we'll go to 14. But beyond that, it doesn't appear, it, it not necessarily ring fenced. If, if by ring fenced, people assume that means that there's no promotion and no relegation. I, 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 it's not quite like that. So there will be opportunities going forward. Um, but I, overall, I think it's absolutely necessary. And um, it, it, there's lots of reasons. I think Chris has spoken about the, the fact that you could, in certain games, give youngsters more of a go than you would do normally if there was a threat of relegation. Because it was big money if you go down and... Uh, high risk. So I think there's lots of benefits for, from not having this uh, trapdoor situation for the next year or two until until rugby gets on, it comes through this COVID thing, a, a pandemic and all the, the pressures that's put on everybody financially. So uh, I don't knock it. And I think in any event, it's, it's good. But, uh, you know, Chris and Mark obviously speak for themselves on that. Boydie? Uh, I think you get a better product, but less dramatic. So, you know, um, English society loves relegation, loves the drama of the fall and the guillotine coming down. And I think I've, I've been quoted as saying a couple of years ago, there was a, a, a two critical matches on at the same time, one to see who was going to make the top four and one to see who was going to get relegated. And the press was all going to the one at the bottom of the league. So there seems to be... There seems to be, you know, a, a love of that sort of dramatic um, part of life. But I, I think um, as far as having a relegation, I think the stakes are very high for the team that gets relegated. And if you look at it, there hasn't been, it hasn't provided a, me a mechanism for clubs. Generally, it goes down and it's, it's, it's all over. Um, so I, I think you get a better product, but but there's no doubt that, that, that there's a theatre and drama about avoiding something. A question from Jim Bryce. I think it's probably for you, Mark. Uh, following the success of the recent Roses game, will we see the Loughborough Lightning playing at the Garden soon? Uh, we will, absolutely. Um, so we announced this partnership with Loughborough Lightning uh, God, probably a couple of months ago now. Uh, we, we, we're really pleased with that relationship. It's going really well. Uh, hopefully a number of you who are at, I think it was the Worcester game, will have seen the, the Loughborough side. They were here, they trained all day, had lots of meetings to, to meet the extended team down here at Franklin's Gardens. And we've actually just agreed a, a date for later in the season. We're just in the process of going through, confirming that with Premiership Rugby. But I think it's one of our matches at home in February where we're going to play a double header game. So Saints will play and then Lightning will play we'll be really encouraging our supporters to, to stay and watch that game. I think those of you that, that saw the um, Red Roses match will have seen the quality and excitement that came through that, that game. Um, and it's a big part of our plan to integrate the Lightning side and set up into uh, you know, our, our broader club, our Saints family here. So absolutely uh, some more women's rugby to come, starting with a doubleheader in February. Yeah, the, it's, it's the relationship... Look, we, we talked about this on the same show with you before, didn't we, about how the relationship works. But for people who don't understand, I mean, it's, I suppose it's evolving, isn't it? Is that the, the fairest thing to say, that it's, it's, the, it's not entirely clear yet where we'll end up in five, ten years' time? And, and that's the beauty of it. Well, we've always said that it was a question of uh, sort of when, not if, we had an elite female team here at, here at Saints. And there are a couple of ways you can go about doing that, really. You could start from scratch. Um, that's quite complex. It um, requires significant financial investment to do it properly, uh, including you know, the expansion and upgrade to a number of our facilities. 
Um, and so we looked at that route and thought about it really carefully. The, the other route that we thought was a really good option was the partnership model. And we're really lucky to have Loughborough, you know, within our sort of geographical reach. So we spoke to them about our ambition in the female game. I think there's some uncertainty around how things may evolve for Loughborough. So the women's game is clearly expanding at pace. It's becoming more commercial. You know, the salary cap doubled last year. Uh, it's unclear how that will evolve over time. It's unclear what the governance structures will look like in women's rugby. So for a university, they're looking at the future and thinking, yeah, we're a university, there's some uh, lack of clarity around how the game may evolve and whether we'll be able to participate in the same way in the future that we can now. And so that allied against our own ambitions in the space are making for a really happy marriage. We don't know exactly what it's going to look like in five to 10 years time, um, but we've got a really strong commitment to work with each other and evolve that. Um, and I think, you know, the starting point is a joint team. We're investing into the setup at Loughborough. Uh, they'll be wearing our crest. Increasingly, some of their kit will uh, resemble, you know, some of the elements that we have on the Saints kit. We start playing some fixtures here at Franklin's Gardens. There's already some really healthy mentoring and upskilling conversations going on involving our coaching group and other rugby resources with the Loughborough setup. So, look, we're really excited about the potential for that relationship in the future. But you're right, there's an element of uncertainty because it's very difficult to predict exactly where the women's game will be holistically, let alone in our partnership itself. Um, you said it's within the geographic region. It's it's a bit close to Leicester, isn't it? <laughs> it is slightly closer to Leicester, um, and uh, we we know for a fact that you know I think they were quite keen to cultivate their own relationship with Loughborough, but um, you know for whatever reason they they uh, they liked us more than they liked Leicester. They've yeah. got very very good judgment at Loughborough. <laughs> <laughs> they have indeed. Oh, this is a good question. So we um, the, these questions and keep them coming in. These questions can be really specific, and I do have some really specific ones coming up, or they can be really general. And I'm going to go for a general one here because uh, it's the sort of question we wouldn't necessarily ask. Dan Fordry wants to know, what is the process for signing new players? And I do think that's a really interesting thing because it's not something we, which we particularly talk about. The three of you, how does it work between the three of you when you, well, from the beginning of identifying a player to the end when he's running out wearing black, green and gold for the first time. Christian. Well, I, I'm, I'm towards the tail end of this one, Graham. I'll come clean on that. It's when it, when it gets to the sort of stage where we've got to commit to three or four years salary and uh, I need to take the board with us to support the executives. And that's probably as much as I get involved. So, Where does it start? Chris, does it start with you? Um, yeah, I think... Uh, we we currently have our squad mapped out to 2025 20, 26 season, um, taking into account the contracts that exist, plus what we've got coming in the academy, plus what sits in the academy. And Paul Shields does a really good job in retention and recruitment, uh, and he does a lot of the a lot of the leg work. But many of the decisions are made in committee between the coaches. Um, we get the SNC, the strength and conditioning involved if we need to, and the medical, obviously, to check. But we sit down and look at where, where we're missing uh, people. We had a meeting, as an example, we've, we had a meeting last Thursday that was three hours long. That was identifying with what the squad is next year who's out of contract, who we think we might let go. If we let those people go and free up X, X number of pounds, where can that best be spent across the group, take into account who's going next year and the year after and what's coming through the academy and stuff. So it's, it's, it's almost a full-time job. And one of the things, one of the very different things about the UK to New Zealand is that because you've basically got to be with very small exceptions, you've got to be a New Zealander to, to play in New Zealand. The pond that we fish in, in or the ponds we fish in for our, for our players, you know, they're vast. So, you know, you're looking, you're looking to fill, say, a second open side flanker's position. What's coming through the academy? When's he going to be ready? No, he's two years away. Okay, we need to find somebody to bring him for two years. 
is there anybody English that's young and high potential that we could get? No, that's that pond's exhausted. Let's have a look at the UK market. No, there's nothing there. Okay, where do we go now? We go to we go to South Africa, we go to Australia, we go to Georgia, we go to Canada. So it's a, it's a you know we go to Fiji. Um, it's a it's a it's a worldwide search in a lot of ways. And so uh, fortunately, Shields has got a lot of good contacts in a lot of areas. Um, and so it's a process. It's a and it's a critical process of, of of getting things right. You don't get it right all the time. Um, every club will tell you that they've had very expensive players on their books that they've got virtually no return from. And every club will have guys that are playing first team regularly that are very cheap and they get amazing value out of. So you never you never get it all right, but there's an awful lot of work goes in behind trying to get the balance, the balance of your team right where you need you know, your strength and where you can have some squad players and how that looks. And as Mark said, we have to rely on our academy more now because like everybody else to fit the new market, the squad sizes have gone down and for every academy boy that's in your squad, you can afford to buy somebody else a little bit, a little bit more. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a big task. And so, um, we, we get a budget set from, from Mark and then go about it and then it goes up the channels and we all have a good discussion, chew it over and, and away we go. And then Shieldsy and, and Mark close the deal, hopefully. I think that's the key thing. Hopefully our supporters can take some comfort from the fact that we, we let the experts make the decisions on the rugby side. But within, yeah. of course, like any organisation, within the confines of you know, the resources that we think we've, that we've got. So... Chris Shields and I spend a lot of time, and then and then obviously uh, the key decisions go up to to John and the board for for approval. We think we've got a pretty good model actually, um, but as Chris says, it's uh, there's an element of science and there's an element of, of art to it too. Yeah, for you, you deal with agents, Mark. Presumably, that's a large part of your job, is it dealing with the agents? So sometimes, yeah. I mean, Shieldsy, who's our head, for those of you that don't know, he's our head of recruitment and retention. So as Chris said, it's, it's pretty much a full-time job, this. There are busier periods in the year than, than, uh, than others, um, but it's a year-round job, that's for sure. Um, Shieldsy holds most of the direct relationships with the agents. I tend to personally get involved with the agents on our sort of bigger, um, our bigger deals. So where we're, where we're investing more significantly in certain players but you know we're, we're blessed with Shieldsy he holds really good relationships with the agents he's a pretty straight talker he's a good negotiator um we, we think we're getting good value actually for the players that we've got in our squad so I, I think our model works really well and and look one of the things that I think Chris is you know without without um blowing smoke up and given he's on the call I think one of the things that Chris has really helped us with is that is that longer term view of how you evolve a squad, uh, particularly the links between you know, what you're doing in your academy and the impact that that has on the future makeup of your squad and the ability, quite frankly, to back yourself to take some risks in some of those decisions, um, you know, given that it can be quite difficult to predict the emergence of players. It's a, you know, it's a late development sport rugby often, and so they're not always easy decisions. But I think we're much better now at standing in the future and defining what we think our squad should look like and then you know, making decisions in the here and now in the context of that strategy. And, and I, think, I think that, um, you know, you're either a development club or a recruitment club or you're somewhere in between. And I think, you know, we've, we've, we've publicly stated that we're trying to, you know, our mantra, our prime mantra is young English and high potential. That's where we start. And where we can't get that, then we need to backfill from, from other parts of the world. Now, the, 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 prob the problem is, is that, you know, it gets really difficult sometimes. And if I look if I look at, if I give you a real live example, we were really disappointed that Travis Reinick chose to go to Montpellier. Um, you know, his, his bank manager wasn't disappointed at all, but, but he, we were disappointed that he left. But we always knew that we need to find a space for Alex Mitchell to grow and come through our process. So you've got to be really careful that if you're going to truly 
promote yourself as a development club, you've got to be brave enough to give people opportunity. And so in that environment, um, you know, Dingle's now starting to flourish, Furbank flourished, Freeman flourished, you know, Hutch, you know, came through the back door and, you know, it, it, it doesn't mean that's going to create instant success because those men are still young players in terms of a lot of things. And so being a development club is a little bit painful long term. The other thing you can do is you can go out to the market and you can buy all your players and you can buy instant success and and other clubs other clubs do that. But at the moment, uh, it's certainly not it's not our chosen model. No, I think if I could just finish on that that particular note because you know we do have a very good structure in in our organisation as Mark and Chris have described something that we didn't have a few years ago and this sort of long looking out over two or three years seeing where the gaps are seeing seeing uh, what we should be doing with with certain players and and where we where we need to plug a few holes. Um, these Chris and his team do most of that, supported by Mark. And as Mark mentioned a minute ago, the board do not step over into that. It comes to a recommendation when when there's something on uh, and, and it gets to that stage. But it, but it's not the board. I'm I'm very clear in my mind. We should not interfere with that side of it. You know, the the, the expert let the experts choose which players and where we want them. And I think evidence of that is how well it works. Is that in, in, certainly in my time, there's not been one single proposal put to the board that the board haven't backed the, the management to go ahead with it. And there's been some pretty big decisions along the way. And I think that speaks volumes of the way we've set it up and how it operates. So I'll do a much more specific question now. Uh, Peter Crane wants to know, elderly people find it difficult to get up and down the stairs in the church's stand. Why can there not be a handrail installed to assist them? Mark, I think that's probably for you. <laughs> well, sorry, can I just jump in there? Because <laughs> it's something that I'm well aware of. At my age, I've got some <laughs> friends who are even older than me, and I know of certain cases where they have either stopped coming or, or not quite so bad, but they've moved to other st stands because they are nervous about it. So I have sympathy with that particular question. It's not an easy fix, though, I can tell you, because we've looked at certain things and, uh, you know, it's you've got to have exit routes and it's got uh, handrails up the middle wouldn't work, um, you know, so it needs to be thought out. But, but they certainly have the chairman sympathy people who, who make that point. Anyway, over to Mark, because he was... <laughs> Hello there. Um, yeah, we have, it's, it's interesting, we have discussed this a number of times internally, actually, because it's a question we've had before. Uh, without, um, without going into all of the detail and, and testing my knowledge of the Green Guide, which is the formal legislation that um, governs how you run a stadium, particularly during emergency moments. The, the issue we have is that our gangways in the stand are the minimum distance that we're allowed under the guidance, which links to building regulations as well as all your emergency procedures. And so it's really difficult in that context to fit in uh, any type of handrail on those walkways, because what it's likely to do is then reduce our capacity or make it really uncomfortable for the people in aisle seats because something's going to be in their way or blocking their sight lines when they look in certain directions. So it's it's challenging from a sort of regulation perspective, but we completely, as John says, empathise with the problem. We, we'll, we'll have another look at that. I, I would also just say to anyone, and this, this um, I guess, is a broader point, not just someone who's struggling with the stairs, but who may wish to you know, change seats for other reasons, we'll always try and accommodate a request to, to move a seat if, um, if the seat that someone is in is, is causing any issue whatsoever. So you know, we'll address that really proactively as we can, but there's a, there's a sort of regulatory point in terms of the installation of handrails, but we'll certainly have another look. I, I remember when we were in Montpellier last couple of years ago, Lenny Newman had a tumble and went down a few flights of stairs. So. Uh... They needed handrails in Montpellier as well. That was more to do with the night before, Graham, I think. I think it probably any, was. Uh, <laughs> uh, Paul Hadley uh, has a quite a specific question as well. Uh, he says, can you uh, please consider reinstating announcements reminding the crowd 
about respecting kickers. It's a long time, it's a long standing tradition at Franklin's Gardens, and I fear we're in danger of losing it with more noise coming from the crowd of late. I haven't noticed that personally, but. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a good point. I mean, it's interesting, actually, because just before the pandemic, when we were, you know, before we had a break from crowds, there were a couple of games where uh, Peter, our announcer, did make that point proactively because we we heard a bit of noise creeping in. Uh, you know, we like, sorry, I didn't catch who the question was from, but, but we share that mindset that we'd like to protect that. And certainly if we feel that uh, some noise is creeping in, We'll use the screen as we do anyway, but we'll ask our announcer, Pete, to, to reference that as we did back in the, whatever that season was, the 29th, the start of the 2019-20 season. Uh, a question here, which goes back to something we touched on earlier. We were talking about the ring fencing or the premiership as it is now. And uh, Sue Bittles asks, does the panel have a view on having 13 teams in the premiership this year and linked to that question another someone else asks are the bye weeks easy to manage or would you prefer they didn't exist so two parts to that question really i don't know who wants to start with that one boyd is it from a rugby perspective um odd numbers are fantastic when you've got uh 24 games in a season plus your european games plus your prc to start at the year at the start of the year and to be able to uh tell your players that in round five, for instance, um, everybody's got a week off is, is gold dust because the only other times you can do it if you, if you have even numbers of teams is when you drop out of Europe or you have to give it onto a rotational basis and then people get injured and so you say to somebody, well, you know, you can take the second week off and, because no one can play every game or it's too onerous. So you've got to you've got to break this down. So I I think personally, an odd number or having buys in the season. And yes, every now and again, you know, Wasps got their buy in round one. And I think Saracens got their buy in round twenty four. You get it. You get a bad one. But if everyone has to take their turn, I'm hugely in favour of preemptive buy weeks. Really helps. See, see, it's interesting because as a fan, I don't, I don't like it. I get Chris's point entirely, and that's something we struggle with in terms of how we manage the squad. As a supporter, I personally, I, I don't love it, you know, because, I th and I think it's early to say because we haven't had a season of it yet. But if you fast forward to the last weekend of the season, and you're in a, you know, you're in a playoff position and you're not involved, it sort of feels like everything's a bit out of your hand. So I, I personally, I don't love it. I think the other, the other. Quick question is how it relates to the point we made earlier on, which is if the premiership season gets longer, what does that mean for international overlaps and the A-League and development competitions? And so I think one of the big questions for our league, quite frankly, is what does it look like over the longer term and how do we sort of address all of that in the context of some of the challenges our, our game has? We're not going to solve that overnight. Um, and whilst we've got it, I think Chris is right. You know, they're really useful to manage load through the bye weeks, but I'm I'm not sure how sustainable that is. Uh, Chris Daniel wants to know. Uh, he says, considering the re results we've had this season so far, apart from the Worcester match, uh, our defence has shown weaknesses and frailty. Will this be addressed in the coming weeks and months? Uh, well, it's really interesting because. We get um, Opta who do the st statistics. Um, we get comparative statistics across massive number of me measurements, um, you know, every week, and it's cumulative. And uh, we're in the top half of the defensive um, stats for everything. The lowest one is points conceded, which which sounds a, a little bit obvious, but Statistically, we're actually one of the better defensive sides in the competition. We've got the lowest number of missed tackles. We've got the lowest number of line breaks. We've got the second to least number of offloads against us. We've got the second to lowest opposition have the second to lowest ruck speed ball against us. We've conceded too many tries and too many points on the basis of ill discipline and bad decisions. I think Ian Vass is potentially a world-class defensive um, coach. He's got that grumpy, gritty, horrible defensive mentality. Uh, he pulls his hair out 
you know, when we concede one missed tackle, I think I think that one of the things, you know, we obviously had a blowout against um, we had a blowout against um, our mates up the road, Tigers, obviously. Um, and even even you know we conceded thirty points against which a sale which is poor, but that was you know when you look at that that was from um, a try that should have never been allowed because it was a a, a blatant obstruction, a brain explosion by the team just a, after half time when we tried a little chip in front of our own goalposts and conceded points and by the way that was never planned, um, and and they scored in the eighty second minute so. Uh, I'd take umbrage with them there. I think our defence is improving all the time. Um, so it's an area that we'll never be happy with any of our areas, but it's an area I think we're doing significantly better than every, every year since I've been here. I think our defence has got better. I think it's a really interesting question from Alexandra Murphy. Uh, she asks, hello, I'm interested in what support systems there are for players and staff in terms of mental health specifically, I mean, there's lots of young people and plenty of pressures, not just for the young players. And I hope that there's space for you all to take care of yourselves. That is a, a very topical and a very interesting question. John, Mark, Chris, to yeah, Chris yeah. What, Mark, who wants to start with that one? I, I can start, I think it's a great question. Um, I mean, I think we're lucky here. We've got a very sort of, collegiate sort of family style culture at, at Saints and so I think um, you know just through the uh, the resources that we have at our disposal at the club I think we, we we're, we're decent at looking out for, for people part part a we have a brilliant uh, club chaplain Jez Stafford who does amazing things around the organization um, you know making himself available taking people for a walk to have a chat, providing explicit support when people have got um, specific things on their mind or, or are in need. We have, in recent seasons, used some dedicated sort of sports psychology resource. Um, we probably, if we're honest, haven't got that model quite, quite right, whether that's been uh, the resource that we've chosen or the way we've deployed that we, we, we've got some room where I think we can improve in that space and we, we recognize the importance of it I think we spend a lot of time in particular with uh, the academy lads and the younger players who are coming through to make sure they understand what operating in the elite environment looks like and the, the strains and stresses that that can put on you and the new questions that that can pose for you uh, you know, as an individual and as groups of individuals. So, you know, I think we've got a number of support mechanisms in place. We last season, we put in place an external sort of employee hotline so that people can pick up the phone to someone independent and impartial from the club to take advice on a range of matters, um, health, well-being, financial, you know, family, other um, but, but, but I, th I think this is an area where you can Im always improve. And so, you know, we'll continually monitor that. We've, we've made good strides, but we've probably got, you know, further steps we can take for sure. Chris, um, I mean, one thing I would say is I, I, when I've spoken, because there've been various mental health campaigns that Premiership Rugby has run over the last year or so. And um, when I talk to young players at Saints, I'm e enormously encouraged by how open they are about talking about their mental health. It's a huge change, generational shift, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it is. And I think that comes A, from the generational shift and B, from I think the key people, I, I would support Mark in saying, Jez does a wonderful job for us. Um, Jez is not your typical pastor because he loves home brew and heavy metal music. So that doesn't depict a typical will pass it. Jez is absolutely fantastic at the bottom of the cliff and what I mean from that when people get into uh, you know into into difficulties in this in this space he's he's a wonderful ear I think Mark Hockley who's dealing with our youngsters is an incredibly empathetic person and, and is a very you know very warm and empathetic person I think we have a very open environment um, I think we have a lot of fun and laughter in our environment, so I think it's not a it's not uh, it's not a really hard military sort of you know it's not that 
Um, there's plenty of time for us to, to, to enjoy each other's company and it's encouraged. Uh, as Mark has said, from a performance psychology point of view, we can, we can probably do better in that space with people um, developing and building resilience to cope with, with stuff that's going to come. So we, we could be accused of being a little bit reactive rather than proactive at the top end of the cliff. But I think it's an area that's, um, and we have people through the foundation uh, and through the club that we have a lot of mechanisms um, that are available in the community that we can reach out through through our medical people. So, yes, we can always do more in this space, but I think it's, it's you know, I think we do a pretty decent job. Yeah, it's good. To, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you both mentioned Jez. He's, he's a fantastic influence around the place, isn't he? I think everyone who knows him would agree. Uh, wholeheartedly with that uh, this is a question for mark and john uh, it's quite a, it's quite a lengthy one this is from christopher harris he says uh the weekend before last there was no coverage of the premiership by bt on saturday or sunday presumably due to internationals was this agreed with prl or simply a bt decision a season ticket plus bt subscription amounts to significant expense to be left without premiership rugby to watch despite there being a full league programme, was disappointing to say the least. Does the PRL have any influence in this area? And might they argue to stop this happening? Well, of course, it is all free on the radio on BBC. That's what I'd say to that. Speak <laughs> on Mark and John. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good, it's a good point. Um, so the way the, broad, I mean, the, the way the broadcast deal works is that what BT do is they essentially buy for their rights fee and agreed number of matches across the course of the season. So they're under no obligation to show a match in any given slot. And so, you know, what they'll have done here is they'll have said on that day, there's international rugby that tends to, um, you know, dissipate the audience a little bit from the premiership game. So they would have shown the game on the Friday night, but not on the weekend when the international games were taking place. And they have flexibility to do that because as I say, they buy, yeah, essentially a certain number of games each each year. So it would have been a BT decision. Premiership Rugby works with BT on the calls that they make on a game by game and a weekend by weekend basis. But that would have been driven by the broadcaster, presumably in the context of you know, the audience and, and interest levels. And again, that's one of the reasons why I mentioned earlier that this, this overlap between Premiership games or league games in different territories and internationals is, is challenging because it does split that it does split that audience. Um, Josh Green wants to uh, ask: uh, Do you feel it would be beneficial to include the Championship uh, and lower league clubs into the Premiership Cup and create an FA Cup style competition? Well, it's what we used to have not that long ago. I suppose if I say that not that long ago, it's probably twenty years. But uh, yeah, it, this is a really interesting one. I, and, I, and I thought, I wondered myself, when you look at a game like last Saturday, if you put Saints first 15 up against the championship, championship club, it wouldn't be a fair contest. But you could see maybe the benefits of bringing championship clubs into it when it's teams like you had out on Saturday. I think on that one, Graham, there's an awful lot of uh, discussion going on about what the championship should be. Uh, and, you know, that's their ongoing discussions. And I wouldn't rule out the sort of picture you paint there, uh, but sometime in the future, it's not ready for it yet. But, um, you know, I, I think certainly personally, I have an open mind on that, where that should go. Um, but certainly it's uh, up, up for grabs if, uh, you know, it depended on what the strength of feeling is around the championship clubs and the RFU and then PRL, of course, as well. Um, one to Mark. Can you tell us more about the new membership scheme, please, Mark? What's the point of activating my card to make to make payments? And how do I benefit? How do I benefit? And how do Saints benefit? Uh, good question. Um, so obviously a, a bit of a change, and I, I should probably uh, hold our hands up here and say um, the rollout of the season ticket cards this year was was not as seamless as it should have been. That was incredibly disappointing given we hadn't had a crowd for a while and for, for a proportion of our season ticket holders, we made it more difficult to get back here than we would have, uh, than we would have liked. So I should probably acknowledge that to begin with. Uh, that aside, 
uh, if those of you affected can look past that. We're, we're really excited about this new membership programme. Really, it was a direct response to some questions we'd had from supporters. So for a while, we've been asked, could we have a mechanism to reward loyalty? Um, and we're also asked quite regularly by supporters who don't necessarily live close to the ground and therefore can't um, commit to a season ticket where they're coming regularly to the gardens, was there a way that they could still have a product that made them feel close to the club? So in partnership with a couple of third parties, uh, we developed this membership scheme. It's also being used at Arsenal Football Club and I think Harlequins and a couple of other uh, sporting clubs. Um, the benefits really are that the more you use your card, uh, you earn reward points, which you can then cash in for sort of money can't buy experiences. That might be a one-to-one a -one Zoom call with Lewis, our captain. It might be discounts around the ground. It might be access to unique events. It might be uh, bidding for a piece of kit that's been worn by one of the players. A whole raft of really unique uh, benefits to reward people's loyalty. So if you activate your card, particularly now we're a cashless stadium here at Franklin's Gardens, and you use that card to make purchases, you accrue all these points, and then you can generate all these brilliant benefits in return. You can also, if you wish, use your card to make purchases anywhere that takes Visa. So again, you rack up points doing that. And there's an added benefit for the club if you do that, which is we receive through a sort of affiliate scheme, we call it, you know, some income in return for those transactions used at certain retailers off site. So benefit to the, to, to the supporter, we hope, recognizing the, the questions that we've had in the past and some, some benefit to the club too. The rollout, um, you know, we wish was slightly more seamless, but um, hopefully now we're up and running, people are clear on how to use those cards. And um, we're certainly seeing lots and lots of people activate them and use them, which is really, really encouraging. And by using the cards, we also learn about some of that behavior and then we can make our offer better here on match days. So lots of benefits all around, we think. Uh, Chris, a couple of people have asked about Lewis Ludlam's captaincy, the decision to make him go it alone and how well you think he's doing? Uh, Lewis has been great. Um, actually, he's been really good. Um, and Alex Waller has actually, I think, uh, been happier in the role of, of that support role rather than the um, out front leadership role. I think he did a really good job while some other guys were, were coming in behind him. Um, but Lewis has been outstanding. He brings um, brings a lot of uh, passion, a lot of emotion. Uh, you know, he's, he's deeply connected to the club. Um, you know, he's he's been really good, and uh, it's been interesting. Um, Fraser Dingwall has also grown a lot in a in a in a sort of a, a leadership role. Um, with Lewis and, you know, one sort of leads the heads and the other one leads the hearts. So, um, yeah, I think Lewis is, Lewis is um, a good man and will, you know, play a lot of games with the Saints. And, and I think, I think he'll be, you know, could easily be the captain here for, you know, for another 10 years. It, and it's interesting you mentioned, you know, Fraser Dingwall having a leadership role. It says a lot about him, how young he is. It's, it, and look, we all know that, Whenever I, for pretty much the last three years, when I first met Fraser Dingwall, you can't believe how young he is when you talk to him because he speaks with such maturity, doesn't he? Oh, I mean, he's got as good a, a good a, a leadership bucket as, as I've seen, uh, understands the game, understands people, um, deep thinker, very intelligent, um, very committed. Um, you know, every every bit of talent that Fraser's got, he rings out of himself, and he's a he's a he's a warrior, and he's a really good adjunct to um, my wild man uh, Luds, who's just brings a slightly different set of skills. But uh, yeah, Dingers is a top man. Yeah, they're a good combination, aren't they? Those two. Uh, Gareth Dean wants to know what's the justification of a parking fee to go from three pounds fifty to seven pounds fifty in three years? Seems like you're ripping off supporters who have supported the club, and it feels wrong, Mark Darbin. Um, yeah, parking. We have we have put up the parking prices. I'll be transparent on that. 
A um, couple of reasons, well, multiple reasons. Um, they hadn't been adjusted in five years. That's not a reason in itself to put them up, but it's a long time without any form of increase. We did a lot of research on parking um, prices before we adjusted the, the, the cost. Uh, we are still by £2.50, the cheapest in the league, uh, with some of the closest parking to the, to the stadium. So we still think whilst the price has gone up, it offers good value, particularly based on what you can find at any other premiership club, £2.50 cheaper. Um, and, you know, in a really balanced and fair way to the points that we talked about at length earlier, um, you know, we've, we've, we've got to continue to, to protect and refine our commercial model as we try and navigate out the back of the pandemic. That, that burden does not and should not fall to our supporters uh, alone or directly. And that's why we've also made great strides with our commercial partners, with our conferencing and events business, with bringing other events to Franklin's Gardens. But there are some areas where we have had to take a bit of price and parking where we hadn't done anything for five years and we were still comfortably the cheapest in the league, we felt was one that um, we needed to have a look at. Yeah, Graham, can I just add a, a little bit on that? Because it's something that's close to our heart, this one. Um, I mean, we, we run the Saints to be sustainable. We don't run it like many other businesses. And I've been in, in, in contact with other businesses for many years. It's not a profit-making organisation, per se. Yes, we made a small profit for, for a few years. We've been making some huge losses recently. And when we look at prices, it's all to do with being sustainable. It's not profiteering. It's not ripping off supporters. It's where we think we can pitch it and, and get some income into this club, which all our season tickets support, uh, many supporters support our club. And whether we put 20p on the price of a pint or the car parking it's because it's ne necessary to balance the books as we go forward it's not about making profit and ripping off our supporters we would never do that not uh, in, in 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 whilst i'm around anyway and i'm sure we've never done it in the past it's it's about balancing the books and it's not an organization that's seeking to make profit so if we get a successful idea we we set a price on it and um Hopefully, most supporters see it that way, that they're helping to sustain the business going forward and their club, the club that they love. It might not be the right time to ask about the quality of free sandwiches you put onto the media, John, if I get the sense. Uh, I'll, come back, I'll come back to that one another time. Um, Tim Cole says, is it likely we'll see Dylan Hartley involved in the club again, potentially in a coaching capacity? Who wants to take that one? Mark, I think. I don't. I don't believe, well, from my point of view, in my discussions with Dylan, uh, he's got a lot of fingers and a lot of pies and tying himself down to a, a regular coaching gig at the Saints or anywhere else, I don't, I don't think is Dylan's modus operandi. So he's been in and out of the club a couple of times uh, for, for specific things and wandered down with Rex, his little fella, uh, for captain's run the other day and had lunch with us. So, yep, we still keep in touch with Dylan and I drop in and drop some pickled beetroot into him every now and again. Um, Is that a Kiwi on, thing? On the way home, oh, well, he, you know, he's got a very nice garden there um, where he is. But, uh, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that that's in his plan at the moment. Mark might know something different. No, no, I agree with that. I mean, Dylan's been explicit with us that he, he doesn't foresee, you know, a, a role for him at the moment, certainly in a full-time coaching capacity. I think he's been quite helpful with some of our younger players in terms of some advice and mentoring, which is great. And we, we're certainly using um, Dylan for a few sort of commercial activities. He's been in some of our hospitality suites so far this season. So you know, getting the relationship right with our past players is really important to us at the club, particularly people like Dylan, who you know, were here for so long, had a, big, had a big impact on the environment and the club more broadly. We'd be mad not to try and make sure that we get those relationships right. So it may not be on the coaching front, but we're really hopeful that we'll continue to see a close connection with Dills and, and many others like him. 
Uh, right, last question, I think. Uh, we're, we're running over time and uh, we're probably all getting a bit hungry. Uh, so this question is, we can see the fine work being done to bring through a new generation of players, but when will this side mature into a side that it, are contenders for the title? I think that's one for you, Boydie, to, to finish this evening. That's an anonymous question, but over to you. Uh, not fast enough for me. Um, it would have been yesterday, but... Uh, the reality is is that we're we're not complete yet. We're still we're still on our journey of growth and development. But I agree, like your anonymous um, questionnaire there, that at some stage uh, the tree's got to bear some fruit. Otherwise, um, you have to go in a different direction. So we're we're really confident that the foundations we're putting in place are solid. Uh, and hopefully um, we'd like to think that that's going to bear fruit um, shortly. Uh, I said that's the last question. Just a final, final one uh, from Jim, uh, who says, Jim Bryce says, uh, Graham, would you on behalf of the supporters thank Mark and Chris and John together with all their teams for their care, commitments and expertise? It's because of, because of them that we have... A wonderful club with great support. And I think that's a, a, a point very well worth making. 18 months or however many months we are now into this these weird times. Mm. Well, the club's still standing, isn't it? And that, that in itself is something of an achievement, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, well, I, I think we should turn that round and say the reason we're all here is because of the great support we have. It makes our job easier. And the pandemic has been an unbelievable representation of, of that. I, I speak to my colleagues in the other clubs and describe what we had in terms of support from our fan base through the pandemic in terms of you know the donations that some people were generous enough to make the support that others provided in other in other ways and quite frankly they're astounded in most of the other clubs it really is remarkable so look it's, it's nice to hear those words but it should absolutely be us turning that on its head and saying thank you to our supporter base yeah uh, i'd echo that uh, well thank you to the three of you uh thank you to everyone who's joined us as well uh, it, these are fun i enjoy these zoom meetings but it'd be nice to do it in person so hopefully as john said right at the start uh we'll all be back in a, a room together uh before too long uh but thank you mark thank you chris thank you john and thank you to everyone else who joined us and uh well we'll crack on with our evenings it's nearly time what coronation street is it tonight boydie is that what you're watching <laughs> a, on a, on a Monday night? Is Ina Cole, is Minnie Sharple still on it? Yeah, she, in New Zealand, she probably is. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Good night. And uh, we'll be back again soon. Thanks very much. Thanks.